is apparent. And this is something that I always found frustrating, like with photographs. I think it's very difficult to photograph nature. Um, you know, some of the best photographs, or the, at least the most memorable ones for most people, are those like Ansel Adams, who will take photographs and then go into the um, dark room and really manipulate them to make them look more like how that place felt. So um, what I'm trying to do is really kind of engage with the place in front of me and kind of discover it over the course of the day. So you can imagine that I go out in the morning and I have a white canvas and certain things that might be very dark at the beginning. Um, I kind of paint things in a very overall manner as I see them. I don't try to really make an under, I don't make an underpainting. I don't really want to scientifically break up or understand things and then fill them in. I want to just kind of grab. It's, it's, it's as though, actually, it's very similar to walking in a very dense place. You know, if you hear a bird, you might look up and then you notice something else because you looked up to see the bird and then all of a sudden you think you're going to trip and you look down and you see different things. So you're constantly focusing in and out of space. And that's how my paintings really are. They're not about this fixed focus. They're not about uh, a fixed moment, more like the Impressionist, um, you know, Monet famously said that after seven minutes he could tell that the light had changed. Well, I'm out there for, you know, sometimes 10, if not 12 hours, so the light is changing a lot, and I actually embrace that complexity. So part of my, I guess, general interest has always been this idea of trying to make a painting that is both expressive and specific to a place. So both may be as realistic as it can be in terms of understanding what I'm looking at in the space I'm in, but at the same time having it be as abstract as possible and about the physical engagement of the painting practice. So what you'll find is that there'll be moments where things look like they really are squeezed out things from the tube, right? And in fact, I do a lot of paint squeezing right out of the tube. And the reason for that is not just that I happen to love paint, but because I'm painting in a very cumulative manner, if in early in the morning there might have been a certain thing that I put that was a different color and all of a sudden I now notice a different color, the only way to get that clean, specific mark and shape is to go in much thicker. So one of the things I do is I basically, hope you guys can see that. There we go. I think you can see that. Um, when I go paint, I have, okay, sorry about that. Um, I basically have a huge truck with a big painting um, scenario. Basically, it's a mobile, uh, mobile studio. And usually when I go to a new place, I'll spend the first day just mixing colors. Um, I don't normally have this on my palette. I had it here because I thought I'd put the computer on it. But I've got this big palette that, that I lift that actually goes with me. Um, and you can see, actually all the various colors that are on there. I actually need this thing. So, I have a lot of artist friends that give me a hard time about how many pigments and how much stuff I take. And they're, act, you know, they're really right to give me a hard time, but in fact, I need all this stuff because it really is about creating a situation where I'm essentially reacting to the changes that I see. So I'm very interested in embracing change um, and, and I really am attracted to the complex uh, places. Sorry about that. Um, so I mentioned that formally I'm interested in kind of the, the materiality of paint and the complex nature of um, of the places I paint. Um, but there's actually a formal reason, not just, I mean, sorry, a personal reason, not just a formal reason. And over time, I've realized that the things I'm attracted to are complicated and, and I'm attracted to change. I'm, a, I'm attracted to things that you can't easily decipher right away. Um, if I see a beautiful scene with an open lake and not a lot of stuff, you know, I admire it, but I don't really want to paint it. So I think that on this personal level, a lot of this interest in things that are complex comes from the fact that I am, um, I'm an immigrant. I'm actually, uh, my parents, I was born in Cuba, uh, were Cuban refugees uh, that grew up in Texas. And although I spoke Spanish, I always felt kind of out of place in Texas. And I always felt a little out of place in different uh well, even in Florida, I feel a little out of place. I live in northern Florida. So there's always been this this sort of not 
quite feeling like I belong. And I think that when I go to these natural dense sites, one of the things I always um, got from them was a sense of connection and discovering and feeling as though I, you know, not only belong here, but I have discovered something that maybe no one else paid attention to. So um, I think that, you know, when I realized that all of my on-site works have really been essentially about trying to, you know, negotiate the complex uh, proposition of sense of place and belonging that so much influence, um, you know, one's personal, I guess, construct, personal identity. Um, a little kind of bulb went off in my head and I started thinking more um, about this idea of identity as it relates to place. So this kind of brings me into my other works that you see, that you will see in the studio. Let's see, I think that one, there we go. You can see that one pretty well. So this is a series that I'm working on called Hyphenated Nature. And what they are is they are some of my on-site paintings then connected to some paintings that are actually the image part is made with Cuban dirt that I gathered from one of my, from a visit, my first painting visit. And the colors that are in this Alber Square type of, well, in an Alber Square shape, those specific colors are referencing houses that were from that valley in the case of this painting that you see. But I think what I might do is I might go into the screen sharing mode because I can show you a little bit of um, a transition from the on-site work to the small on-site work from Cuba that then brought me into thinking kind of more conceptually about the idea of place versus being in the place. So let me do a screen share here. Oops, I guess I need to do this. All right, let's do a screen share. So here is um, a picture from, this is a 15 panel piece that was at the Orlando Museum at the Florida Prize, 2000, I guess last year, 2019. Uh, and uh, the scale of this is pretty obvious, but it's, it's, four, it's uh, 15 feet, no, 14 feet by 20 feet wide. And these are banyan trees. Um, I was able to paint a series of uh, independent paintings, which is what I always do. I never, Although I knew I was going to make a multi-panel piece for this one, I actually, ne I didn't, I never think that it's going to be 15 panels that all add up. I was able to paint down in Sarasota. I've always wanted to paint banyan trees. They fascinate me. And there's a whole bunch of things I can talk about with banyan trees on their own. But I did a bunch of paintings and I found a way to make 15 of them talk to one another and create sort of new spaces. Um, and this was shown originally at the um, Orlando Museum of Art. Um, I mean, sorry, at the uh, Ringling Museum in Sarasota. Um, so here's a picture of the Florida Prize and you can see a few other of the large scale pieces. Um, so I don't always paint super, super large, but because I paint on site, one thing I want, I guess I wanna point out is the large, the widest I can put in my truck is four feet. So I'm kind of limited to five by four foot canvas, right, as the largest individual one. So I've always wanted to be able to paint larger. And the way to do that has been through these kind of diptychs and triptychs and so forth. So um, here's an example of a triptych. So these are five five by four foot paintings. And I just want you to notice that these paintings, as I mentioned, they're all done individually. They're actually part of that original 15 panel piece, just reconfigured differently. So... Here's a close-up of that 15 panel piece. And here I just want to point out that if you notice the kind of intersections in the middle where the various panels meet, I really love discovering, as I mentioned, I love discovering you know, what nature reveals over time. And when I make individual paintings, one of the things I really, really love is being able to find these new spaces that are created when individual panels that aren't contiguous, right? So they're not meant to, you know, they don't exist in nature together this way. But when I put them together, I find these new exciting spaces. And to me, this idea of discovering new spaces, you know, with things that shouldn't be together or people didn't assume that they could work, reminds me very much of, in a way, a lot of what we're going through now with this kind of, you know, I guess, pushing back on immigration. But I find that, you know, when new 
ideas and new people go to a place, they enhance it, right? New discoveries, right? New connections are made. You know, you don't lose any of the stuff that was already there. You just find new things. And so I, I, this, this particular painting is called Fluid Perceptions, Banyan is Metaphor. And I think it very much talks about the formal and the um, kind of personal ideas of what a banyan tree and this idea of reconfiguring and finding new spaces uh, can be. Um, these are the same 15 panels, but because the, the ceiling wasn't high enough, I reconfigured them yet again in another configuration. So here now you've got um, some of them on one side and some of the other. This was at the Naples Museum this year at, uh, in the Florida Prize Show. Uh, okay, so let's move on. So this one is still the Florida Prize, but what I want you to notice is that front wall. That front wall has, I've never been able to work in Cuba. I've only been able to go back to Cuba five times because there's actually a lot of restrictions on Cubans that were born there but left before 1971. There's still lots of political garbage going on. So I was finally able to paint in um, Pinar de Rio. I'd done a lot of research on Cuban artists, landscape artists in particular, because my family almost was not able to leave Cuba. So I almost would have been a person who would have been part of this Cuban painting history. And so I uh, basically found as many images and did as much research as I could. And it was very apparent that all the important artists painted in Pinar de Rio. So I went and painted in Pinar de Rio for two weeks. Um, and because I couldn't take oil paints or, or, or all of my materials, I mean, there's no real art supply stores. I had to paint on paper with acrylic. But I wanted to replicate the way I painted as much as I could. So it was still this kind of cumulative manner. Um, but with the acrylics, I was able to have, you know, more watercolory effects because I kind of needed that for things to dry in a time where I could still bring them back. So I did a bunch of these and I thought that I was going to then do a series of work when I came back to the U.S. based on those. And I did do some paintings that were based on those paintings that looked a lot like my normal paintings, but those really didn't satisfy me. And I got really excited. Um, I had brought back some dirt pigment. I turned it into pigment myself. And I really just wanted to repaint um, either some of my own paintings with the Cuban dirt or repaint some paintings of some famous Cuban artists with the dirt. Because I felt that as a landscape painter, how can I still make work about the land when I'm no longer on site? And conceptually, it made perfectly good sense that if I used the site, then all of a sudden I was painting always on site or of the site, right? No matter what I was painting. So um, this one I called the Garden of Earthly uh, Delights. Um, no, it's not the garden, it's the Garden of Earthly, it might be that. Um, it's based on Bosch's thing, but it's um, th in this particular area, they grow a lot of tobacco and uh, um, things that they use for rum and yeah, of Earthly Delights. Yes, the Valley of Earthly Delights, which is the Pinar de Rio Valley. Um, and then from there, um, I started thinking about uh, my modernist Bauhausian uh, upbringing in college and how I was always sort of fighting, you know, the I didn't like symmetry and I didn't like hard edges. And so although I loved color theory um, and I loved a lot of things about the kind of Bauhausian schooling, I always wanted to sort of break the grid and, 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 and just you know, have to be different in that way because there was something too confining about it. So here's uh, a series I did called uh, Homage to Vinales, and it's made with Cuban dirt. And you can see that although I do embrace the grid quite a bit, it's still a little bit broken. Um, and then the last one I'm going to show you on here is a nine panel one. Each of these is three feet by three feet. Um, and the, said the colors that are uh, that I base the squares on are colors that I pulled from the houses of the people that live in this particular valley. So every single color is as close as I could get to uh, the colors I saw. And then these happen to be scenes from the valley. So going back, let's see, let's go back into the studio here. Um, so back in the studio, you can see, let's see, back in the studio, there we go. Back in the studio, you can see this one. You can see this piece. So this piece, let me get a little closer here. It's hard to do this. It's hard to do this when uh, you're also trying to talk. So this piece are two on-site paintings from Northern Florida, but the central piece is actually, so what I did here is instead of pulling the colors from the houses from Vinales, since the two paintings 
around it are from northern Florida. What I did is I pulled some colors from my own painting. And then the painting that's in the middle is one of the paintings from a, it's a very famous painting in the, um, in the Cuban uh, National Museum. It was one of my favorites when I, when I visited. So what I've done is I basically have a lot of research, a lot of books. I'll pull out the image so you can see it. Let's see if the computer, let's see if this works here. So in this book, there's this image by Carta. So I took elements from there, not just because I love this painting, but I also thought that it directly related to my paintings. So essentially I'm repainting paintings that are from the Cuban landscape, you know, famous paintings in the Cuban landscape tradition and sort of hyphenating them with, with my own work. Um, here's slightly different but similar example from hyphenated nature. This was an on-site uh, piece I did in Washington State of the Skykomish River and its flowing waters. And I think you can see how nice and fun and thick that is. Um, on-site painting. Um, and then this is, because this is about rushing waters and rocks, I'm fascinated by the rocks in that place. I thought this is a little different. It's not a famous painting, but it's El Moro, which uh, people who know the Havana uh, Harbor or anything about Havana would probably know about El Moro. El Moro is um, a very famous, um, well, um, oh my gosh, now I'm escaping. Uh, uh, you know, we have one in St. Augustine um, Fort, right, that's on this large rock that protrudes and really protects the Havana Harbor. So I wanted an image of water sort of clashing on that rocks and pulling the colors uh, out of the painting on that one. So let's see. I have some questions on here. So let's just, we can, we can do a little more studio action here. Um, yeah, oh, and I'll show you one more painting. This might be fun too. We've got this fun Florida painting, which has some good thick stuff going on. And I'll turn around and show you some of those other nine ones that, uh, that you saw. So I'm gonna read some of these questions here. Um, so I see someone that, that really seems to like the pigments from the Cuban dirt. Um, yeah, actually I can show you my Cuban dirt stash. I've got a bunch of this Vinales, what ground Vinales dirt. Um, and I can use, um, so I had to, you know, do the whole old fashioned um, sifting and grinding. And, and I've done some that were oil based. I've done some that are acrylic based. Um, you know, they have both cons, pluses and cons. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about that. I, I have a whole extended series of work I wanna do with those. Um, so let's see. Um, Cumulative nature is, yes, it's featured, let's see. Um, yeah, so it's, I wanted to make sure that I showed both of these things because I think most people know more of my on-site work. Um, and that is what I've done the most of, but I'm really excited about this new work. And um, the only time I've ever shown any of the newer work was at the Florida Prize. They had a couple, um, Rancic Yoon, who is the curator there, wanted to also include some of my, um, new, what I call the uh, Echo con Cuba, which means made with Cuba series. And those, all those little squares have some of that were uh, uh, from that original series. I call the hyphenated nature ones, the ones that have some on-site work and some Cuban pigment work. So let's see, there's more questions here. Um, so how long did it take you to find your style and what originally inspired you to paint the way you do um, so boldly and colorfully? Um, so style is an interesting thing because as a teacher, it's something, um, you know, I'm always telling students, look, your style will come. And, and, and the way you sort of find it is, you know, you need to learn as many different things as you can, but then you have to ask yourself, do I seem to want to do this because I need to and I love it or because I'm being kind of lazy and maybe don't really want to learn how to do something else. And if you keep going back to wanting to do something or even the opposite, not wanting to do something. Like in my case, you know, I, I studied, uh, you know, we, I had, God, I took so many design classes, but um, I really just never liked symmetry. I like asymmetry. I like asymmetrical balance. That always just appealed to me. Um, it took me a long time to maybe, you know, connect all the dots as to why. Um, but I think your style comes from what you end up just finding you have to have in your work, right? Um, 
And the reason I paint, one reason I actually paint so, um, I guess, boldly is I kind of have to. I mean, if I'm working on site and I'm working this large, I only have so much time before the paint starts drying. And in northern Florida, it's way faster than in a slightly colder place. So on average, these four by three foot paintings, uh, by the second day, they have kind of a nasty skin on them. So I really, on the four by three foot paintings, um, I can really only paint on them two days before they become something else. They don't have that image emerging out of paint uh, type of feel that I want them to have, right? So, um, and if you think about it, it makes sense why many on-site landscape painters either paint very small or they paint very thin and loose and maybe with not so much detail, or if they have detail, they often will go back after something's dried and add more detail, right? Or they might then work from photographs to get that type of detail in certain areas. But I'm just there having this experience. And within that experience, I have to be bold. You know, if I, you know, I, it's, it's like people often ask me, when do you know when it's done? Right? And I say, I don't know when it's done but I know when it's not done. So it's a sort of essence of everything seeming like it might all collapse on itself, but somehow holding together. Um, and kind of going back to maybe, you know, my, you know, my roots, um, having grown up in a household where um, everything was about what was expected or happening or should have been happening in Cuba, but yet I wasn't living in Cuba. You know, it was a weird, it, it was like, I needed to assimilate, but I really couldn't. And, and the family, you know, I think this is something that happens with a lot of immigrant families that, that it's like we're torn between trying to keep on, keep with something that doesn't quite gel where you are now and finding kind of that balance. So I think this idea of having things that seem like that you can't quite make sense of them and still making it make sense is uh, something that's always interested me. And I have a really uh, good friend of mine, Mark Messersmith, who's a fabulous painter. When he first met me, and got to see my work, he instantly was like, he said, Lillian, your paintings are just like you. That from a distance, they all make sense and hold up. But up close, they're like, they all, they're like crazy. Um, and he met that, you know, uh, in, in a good way. So uh, let's see. I have a couple more questions. Can you talk more about your family in Cuba and how that relates to your practice working with nature? So um, I have a very small family. I only have uh, one much younger sister um, who doesn't have children and I have. And uh, my mom has one aunt and my dad was an only child. So I grew up in this country with no f extended family, really, um, that I you know, knew. My grandparents came uh, much later, but they didn't stay very long. So, um, and my parents have been, um, my dad's been, uh, he passed away quite a long time ago. So when I first got to meet my family in 1999, it was really shocking to me because I thought I would have absolutely no connection to Cuba because I left when I was three years old and we came to this country. When I was five, I learned to speak English in San Antonio, Texas. I uh, lived in Texas 30 years. Um, so when I went to Cuba, I was actually very shocked at how like at home I felt, but I could only go for, I think it was two weeks or something I went for the first time. And then this was 1999. And after that, um, uh, George Bush got elected and they changed the rules that instead of just extended family could go visit Cuba, it, you had to have immediate family. And because I only had one aunt and my only two cousins in the world live in Cuba, um, I wasn't able to see them again until um, Obama uh, opened that up again. And I think that was in 2000, I don't know if it was 2001. So I've been to Cuba now three times since then. Um, but this last time was the first time I got to paint. And uh, the connection... Uh, I guess maybe one of the other connections that I that I discovered was I have a great great uncle called Juan Tomas Roy, and he is a famous botanist or was a famous botanist in Cuba. He died in 1972, but he they still use several of the books he wrote uh, on covering all the endemic plants, and so I was fascinated by that, and I was able in this last trip to go to the Juan Tomas Roy Experimental Station. And a whole bunch of new work is cooking that is not, I'm not showing you in the studio, but I, I can show you, I can show you a couple things. Um, so I'm super excited that I have this, this great, great uncle who is, like I mentioned, he's one of the most uh, well-known um, botanists. Actually, I can show you a picture of what he looks like. How about that? That might be fun. So there's lots of books on him, a couple books on him anyway. Um, 
So he wrote all these different books, but here is, here's a picture of my Juan Tomas Roy. And he has several plant species uh, that are named after him, and he has a huge collection. Here's some of the things that uh, I discovered that the Smithsonian, Harvard collection, um, a number of herbariums across the, uh, the country, I know people probably like my, my mask over there, um, have uh, actual specimens that he either collected or named after him. So I'm doing this huge uh, project that I'm calling Recollecting Hroig, Hroig, which is my last name because his last name is also Hroig. Um, and I will be adding Cuban dirt to some of these pieces. Um, so that'll be, that'll be fun. So let's see. Um, how long did it take you? Okay, we got that one. Um, yeah, so the making, a lot of people are really interested in the Cuban dirt uh, stuff. Yeah, it's actually very easy to make uh, a type of pigment from dirt. Um, Golden has this, this wonderful thing called GAC 100. And essentially it's a binder. And I find that one to be the easiest one. You can go out and pretty much get anything you want and grind it up nice and small, you know, very fine. Um, you, know, you put it through a sister for, sister, what, you know what I mean, those things. Now I'm having a, a, a Spanglish thing going on here. Um, but anyway, you, you, you have to grind it up, you know, just like you would normal pigment. And you really can just use that GAC 100 to make a really good binder with it. So let's see. What else can I talk about here? Um, and if someone is thinking, is my studio always this neat? The answer is no, the studio is not this neat. Um, if people are maybe thinking, why do you have so many big boxes in here? It's because, actually, what I, what I, what I can't really see is like this box, if, if you notice this other box down there, because my paintings are so thick, and I don't frame them because I often like to see if I can turn them into groupings. I had to figure out how to be able to have, you know, to organize and, you know, store and even move the paintings without having to put wrapping on them. So I designed a system where I can have my paintings with their big, their nice thick surfaces um, uh, in a way that they're not going to damage each other, but also in a way that I can store them in my studio. So here's... Of fun. So I know sometimes people ask if I work with my fingers as well as squeezing things out, and the answer is yes. I don't start with my fingers. I start with brushes, um, and I tend to move on to fingers because I do wear gloves, but the fingers allow me to kind of lift something and put it right on the color without lifting the color up. And then the tube is the most uh, aggressive way that I can uh, do that. But, um, you know, that's pretty much what I do. I go out, uh, at least with this piece in particular, I go out and I'll paint all day and then I'll come back out the next day and go, oh my gosh, it looks so different. And that's really the hardest part is not the first day, it's that second day. Because the second day you, you now have enough, you have a lot on this painting. But in the morning, it looks very different than when you finally got to the point where you had a lot on, on it in the late afternoon. So then the decision is, what do you keep and what do you change? Because you're not seeing the same thing that's there. So really what I'm painting is that it's not any moment. It's this idea of the experience of the day and what does that actually look like. And I don't really know. Um, but at the end, I have a painting that looks like something that does seem right and like what I did experience. Um, so I know a lot of people want to see them in, in person. Um, and it's true. I mean, I actually have, I know all artists to some degree will say that it's very difficult uh, reproducing their work. Um, you know, it's much better in, in real life. But I mean, I've even had curators who knew my work pretty well. And when the work arrived, they were even shocked at how much more, I guess, uh, visceral it was in real life. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, see, let's see, what shows are coming up? Um, well, I guess that depends on when COVID uh, uh, seems to, you know, might be over some. 
Uh, I'm not sure. There might have been something at the FSU Museum. Um, I'm always uh, looking for interesting shows to be in, so um, I definitely hoard a little bit of work. I've got all those banyan trees I'd love to continue to show, and um, that is something I always try to tell uh, students is that it is good to try to have, you know, some work available. So when you are asked to have a show, you, you know, it's especially in my case, I can't just run out and make a painting necessarily um, at any time. I really do have to um, have some extended time. So let's see, any other questions that I haven't yet answered? And I'm not even sure how well I'm doing with time. Let's see, it's 8.32. So Melissa, am I doing okay with time? I think so. Maybe what I can do is I can do some close-ups. I can do some. I don't want to give anybody like a headache looking at this. So let's see, there's a question here. Do you feel that your formal approach of going, and I hope I can, I hope this isn't, let's see. I wonder if I can actually see all this question. Do you feel that your formal approach of going with what you can grab as you put, as you, I guess, is an, is an analog that has a specific relationship for diasporic identities? Yeah, no, I absolutely do. And, and, and what, what's interesting about that question is that, I mean, I'm 53 years old, and when I was going to school, I mean, this would have been the 80s, I didn't have the language that there is now. I didn't know I was trying to essentially, you know, maybe decolonize, you know, the, 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 the curriculum in, in many ways. But I always, you know, when, when my teachers would say, you know, use more gray, or, you know, why are you wanting, why are you trying to use everything in the kitchen sink? I knew that I knew why they were saying that to some degree, but I was still offended enough by it that I, 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 my attitude is, I'll show you, I want to use, I, I can imagine everything in the kitchen sink actually being really interesting. Um, and as a side, uh, when I first got to curate a show um, that uh, was about more being more, I purposely found a painting that had everything in the kitchen sink in it by Nicola Verlato, and it was an amazing painting, and that sink really added a lot to it. So um, I do think more can be more. Um, so I do think that that this that this kind of idea of you know grabbing what you can and making something new kind of ties back into my interest in when I make a series of work, seeing if I can find new relationships with these things that were individual, right? Things that weren't there before until you put things that shouldn't be together together and you know, lo and behold, something really interesting happens. Um, and that's another um, kind of thing too that I, my husband often says that I'll paint things that he'll just walk by to get to the view. And I think um, part of what happens with people who maybe are new to a country or trying to fit in is that we do tend to be hyper aware um, and really look for those moments that we can somehow maybe, you know, connect to. Um, but, uh, you know, also growing up or, or knowing about that kind of frugality that Cubans uh, have, you know, you got to, you know, you don't want to throw anything away. You want to make do. And maybe that's one reason I'm, I work cumulative. Like I never scrape anything off. I just put more stuff on. So um, but I didn't realize all of this kind of going back um, to Pierre's question. I didn't realize all of this really until I was kind of later, because then I'm like, wow, you know, maybe my work all the stuff I talk about in a formal context is really deep inside in this sort of onion of my work. It all connects back to my personal, I guess, identity. And really, ultimately, I think everything is a self-portrait. I mean, Julie Heffernan will say that, right? Um, and I, you know, I've always agreed. I mean, my, you know, just like Mark said, my paintings are just like me. Um, I am that thing back there in many ways, right? So, um, Yes, I think it absolutely uh, does connect back to um, to my kind of experience of being in this kind of broader kind of di you know diasporic um, place. Um, so, 
Let's see. So someone asked about uh, that they've seen my work produced in Washington State, Florida, and Cuba. Your style translates wonderfully, um, uh, depending on the location. Where would you like to paint next? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I didn't show you guys any of my uh, stuff from the Northeast, but on the web page, um, I mean, I haven't put the newest, newest stuff, but on the web page, I split my web page up into region. So I do have things from like the Northeast. Um, you know, you can't beat the North, you know, the Northeast in the fall. So I would like to go back there. Um, um, I'm hoping to go back to, to McDowell at some point uh, in the near future in the fall and do something there. But, um, you know, there's, I'd like to go back to New Mexico. Um, I, I went to New Mexico for a little bit. And although you might go, well, it's not dense. What's interesting about New Mexico is there's a lot of atmosphere. So, and there's rocks and there's layers. So you can see so far away that in fact, there's this other, um, there's this other kind of way to translate the complexity of, of, of that distance. Um, uh, so there's a lot of places I'd like to go, I think, you know, but part of it is, you know, where can I take my big old truck? Um, because that is a challenge I have, that there's some pretty interesting residencies in different uh, places. But if I can't really take my truck and kind of paint all day uh, without being, you know, on private property, worried about being shot or, you know, being surrounded by concrete, um, that can be a problem. So, um, but I want to go back up to Maine. Maine was pretty interesting. Um, I love painting in Florida in the winter. You know, it's pretty miserable in the summer. So hence, you know, one of the things I do tend to do in the summer is try to go somewhere where it's a little uh, cooler. Um, but if anyone has any suggestions, ideas, or if they know anyone that has lots of property that they don't mind me painting on, um, I know about some of the parks. Um, some of the parks uh, are interesting, but they may not quite work for what I do. Um, but uh, always interested to go to a place that I can stay at least about two weeks is ideal. Um, you know, it was really beautiful. I got to have a show at the Huntsville Museum and they when I usually, when a museum invites me to have a show, what I like to do is I like to then ask them if there's a place that I could go to paint for a week or two, um, you know, someone's ranch or a park or, um, you know, just some place I can have access to. And then that way I can have a piece that is made from the region that I'm showing. And, and that happened when I showed at the Huntsville Museum. I got to paint in a place just north of, of, of Huntsville called Paint Rock. And that was amazing. Um, that part of northern Alabama was really beautiful with hills and sinkholes. And, and uh, it was just really pretty amazing. And I was very honored that the museum um, purchased the piece that I painted in Paint Rock, which is in the permanent collection of the Huntsville Museum. So, so that's always fun when I can do that. Um, I had a show at the Polk Museum. And they got me hooked up with the um, Disney Nature Preserve, which is in Kissimmee, Florida. And I got to go out there and uh, paint for, um, it was a week or maybe 10 days, and I made a diptych that was uh, in, in that show at the Polk Museum. So that's always fun for me to do. So I see that you guys have the website up there. Yeah, you just get to spell my name and it should pop up. Um, so someone is saying that they lived in New England and New Mexico and they understand my desire to go back. Um, yeah. Um, you know, there's so many beautiful parts, uh, you know, in the world, but in this country. I mean, I love driving for some reason. Maybe it's, um, you know, it's actually kind of interesting because I drove this summer, I drove to Washington and I had one of those little, um, I looked on Google Maps and it's 30, you know, it's 3,500 miles from Florida to Washington State where I was painting and then back. And people often go, oh my God, that's crazy. How can you do that? But I have to say, I enjoy it. You know, I love um, when you go through the different states, like I can always tell as soon as you're getting close to New Mexico, you feel it. It looks so different. Um, no matter what part of Texas you're cutting in, when you get close to New Mexico, it changes. Um, you know, Wyoming has its own special thing. Um, uh, you know, Texas was its own interesting animal in many ways. I mean, you go, and you go down to Big Ben and it's very different. So I encourage people to go on road trips. Um, I think people don't do it as much as we used to. Um, but it's really a great thing that this country is so different. And if you really can take a road trip, um, for me, a road trip with a destination to paint is the ideal. So, 
Let's see. Um, lots of nice comments. Not not too many questions, but I think I might be. Um, I think I might be. Let's see. I talk a lot, but I know that. Let's see, I don't know what to do, other than. Uh, Actually, that's kind of fun having my bun in there. Um, one thing that I do encourage people to do with my paintings is to look at them far away because far away they really are a different experience than up close and that's part of what I hope that far away they do hold together like Mark say they look specific and naturalistic right um, and even realistic if you want to use that word um, illusionistic but up close you go you might go oh my gosh did she really just stick her finger in that or blob that out and I said, usually the answer is yes, she did. And then there's kind of that fun, you know, recognition of the materiality of the surface and, and the process of painting. So I have a question about how has the last few months affected your work and have you used this to benefit uh, or has it been used to benefit my practice? So it's actually, th th that's, a, th that's an interesting question because it actually affected me differently than I thought. I kind of thought that maybe, you know, I'd have more time to paint on site. But one of the things that happened was that the, um, the parks, the national parks got closed, as you, we all remember. And I realized that I needed to figure out how to paint in the studio. And so since I had started that series of Hecho con Cuba uh, and the, you know, and the Vinales series, the ones that I showed you um, in the slide talk, actually, like, what happened was, oops, I guess we don't need to do that. Let's do a screen share again. Um, I was at the, um, I had, a after I came back from Cuba, um, that would have been uh, February, March, uh, 2017. I had a residency at the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans. And in anticipating this, I knew, since this is a fairly short residency, it's for three weeks, I knew that I wasn't going to have enough time to really paint on site. And also, part of this residency is to make connections with other artists, and they have this beautiful space. So I thought, if I'm going to spend all my time in New Orleans being on site painting, what's really the point of being in this group and in this space? So I wanted to make work in the studio. So that's when I started experimenting with the dirt and these albers. So this is part of that Hecho uh, con Cuba homage to Vinales. Um, so going back to the pandemic, when I came, um, when it was clear that things were closing down and I couldn't just go out and paint, I was like, oh, I better figure out how to paint in the studio. And so I did, uh, I started doing a few more of those, but that's when I did the deep dive into the Juan Tomas Roy research because I had done a good amount of research before. So I knew about the books and I'd read a bunch of stuff and I'd found, uh, I had a list of the names of the plants that were named after him, but I hadn't really done a deep dive. So now I have like a 90 page Google doc with all these hyperlinks to all the uh, plants that he actually physically touched and collected uh, that are now in different um, herbariums across the country. And I've been collecting images and printing some out and having um, ideas of how to um, add my layer of information to them. How is, you know, my interest in landscape from an artist's perspective, how is that going to intersect his interest in nature from a botanist perspective and how that will overlap with our interest in Cuban landscape. So there's a couple sub-series um, building up from that research, um, but that was the outcome of the, of the coronavirus. I wasn't planning on creating a 90-page document with you know basically everything he's ever collected, and now I have that. So I have all these images uh, that I will be now working for the next couple, probably a couple of years. I mean, not solely on that work. I'll still be doing this stuff. Um, but that's, that's, that's really how the pandemic has affected me. I had to be inside. And so I was on the computer doing research. And uh, there's a lot out there. So um, can you share what you're working on? Well, so I am always working on, like, I, this is actually... Um, you know, I am still working on these. I've got more of these hyphenated nature ones. You know, there's a few more things I might do to these, um, but you can see the dirt. You can see the nice lumpy dirt there. Um, so I am doing um, 
wonder if you can kind of see how you know this one's not quite done yet um, you know so there's 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 more of these but the uh, the research is I've, I've printed out a whole bunch of prints um, from several subgroups of the um, I mean, these are small prints. I have large prints in another place. Um, I didn't want to bring them out to the studio, but there's there's uh, the first group of, of work that I'm going to uh, paint on and do things to are a series of works that were named after my great great uncle Juan Tomas Roy. So they're like this one. This one is called um, Terra Fugt Whatever Roygi. This one is uh, Terra Furta Roygi. This one is uh, Dorisontia Roigi. So I have a series of um, plants that he actually physically collected. So it says here, collected by Juan Tomas Roy. This one is Brosamia Roigi. So I'm going to now, I'm thinking about this idea of phenotypical plasticity, which is a term primarily used in plants, but it can be applied to, um, to uh, human behavior. And, and what it basically is, is how um, one, um, and actually Piero really liked this, it's, um, it's basically the idea of how plants adapt, and it's not quite adapt, they don't really use that word adapt, but how they're able to survive in places that aren't the ideal, right, or not necessarily, um, so not quite the endemic place. So I really thought, wow, this is, this is how people, you know, how immigrants really deal with things is we we use our phenotypical plasticity to figure out you know we can't change it at the genetic level but we are figuring out how to adopt not fully assimilate but somehow adopt to a place that's not our natural environment or not the ideal environment for our genotypical I guess you know identity and so that's really kind of my overarching idea is I'm going to somehow um adapt these. So one of the things I have in mind is I want to start a garden of, in because in Tallahassee things freeze, so what I'm going to try to do is I have a list of plants that are in the same family. I'm trying to, I've found the ones that are the closest to what some of these plants that are very rare and endemic to Cuba, so I can't actually grow them, let alone, I mean, I can't even get a, a, a document of these, so I'll just, you know, I'll touch by him. Um, I'm going to try to plant these in my garden and paint things that are from the family that are similar. I'm also going to, so there, there's a series of things I'm doing, but they're going to be studio-based, conceptually-based, um, and based on, um, you know, a lot of these Roigi specimens that I'm fascinated by. So let's see. Um, so can I describe a little more how repainting paintings from the Cuban landscape tradition um, works with the conception of hyphenation? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, um, the first time I saw contemporary Cuban art was at a show, um, well, actually, it was when I was in, in, in graduate school, and, and it was, in, I think, in the Bronx Museum. I read somewhere that there was a show of contemporary art, and I jumped on the train to go see it, and I thought this show was going to be so embraced by the Cuban community because I had heard so much about um, uh, censorship and this and that, and I saw this show, and I thought, oh, my gosh, these Cuban artists are really... At the, I mean, they're really criticizing. I mean, they're really like saying stuff that's not like Castro's great. They're saying Cuba's great, but they were being critical of the government, and that kind of took me back because that went against kind of what I was expecting. Um, so since that moment, um, I, I got to actually meet a number of actual Cuban artists that were close to my age at another big show at, at a. Um, Marilyn Zetlin at uh, U Arizona State University had a big show, I think in 1980, no, not 87, that would have been 97, um, at ASU. And I met a lot of artists that were my age. They would have been my peers. And so this idea of me as an artist, had I not, had my parents not left Cuba, these would have been my peers, right? So um, I feel as though there's a little bit of me that still is, wanting to think, you know, what would my work have looked like had I been there? You know, would I still have been a landscape painter? Probably not, because I would have had different um, conditions that I might have been fighting against and also kind of different schooling, so they, it would have been different. But given that I'm here, 
I still kind of maybe think about if I were a Cuban landscape painter, you know, how do I insert myself in the tradition of Cuban landscape painting? Um, because I'm here, not there. Um, but I want to literally, you know, walk in people's footsteps, the famous artists, which I did when I painted those acrylic on paper paintings. But by repainting the paintings of the Cuban painters, I find that that is just another way to just feel like I'm making a connection to a history, a heritage that I have, but really have not very much been allowed to access, right? So um, maybe it's just kind of more of a personal thing. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, so I am going through, I have a, I have a list of, of, of landscape artists that are in the Havana um, Museum that I have seen that, that I felt were very um, strong. I also have another series of work that's based on famous paintings from the uh, Vinales Valley. Um, and another kind of interesting thing about the Roy pieces is certain, uh, certain ones of these, other botanists uh, went later because uh, most of these he, just, he uh, collected between I would say 1917 uh, and 1935. So uh, later on, a number of people went and recollected some of these Roygi specimens, and they actually have GPS markers, or, or at least the you can get close to where they're found. So I'm hoping that on a future trip, I can go back and actually try to find, with a GPS thing, the actual location where some of these plants uh, were some specimen samples were taken and then I want to paint those actually at the site, right? The, so that's, you know, I have lots of things kind of trying to get me to make connections that I feel I don't have. So, um, so it seems like I have five minutes left for one last question. Um, I have a lot of nice comments. Thank you. Um, let's see, do you ever get overwhelmed when you make these large paintings? And if you do, how do you fight through that? Um, I absolutely get overwhelmed, but you know, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed all the time and I've just learned to kind of be, become fairly comfortable with, um, complexity and, uh, you know, I don't, um, I don't want to say I go with the flow because I'm definitely a person who wants to try to have some order where that can happen. Um, and maybe a quick, just example of that is, and I tell this to my students, when I'm painting, it is a bit of a disorder, but if you notice my, my, my palette, notice how I've got, I've got my greens, I've got my yellows, right? You look at my palette here, everything is in a spectral manner, right? So it's like where I can have some order so that when I'm painting, I can just sort of be in the moment and hope that somehow as I'm reacting, something that I see goes, wow, that really kind of makes sense. So yeah, I'm always trying to, um, you know, try to have some order somewhere <laughs> and then go crazy. Um, so yeah, I get overwhelmed, um, but that's part of the discovering, right? You kind of have to, you know, if you don't go out on an adventure, go to a new place, you'll never discover anything new, right? So, um, so yes. Um, and I think, Let's see, I think that might be the last question. So everything, um, yeah. So there you have it. Oh, and I do wanna show my mask. This is a person who likes a lot on a mask. And if I think someone asked about the um, the studio, um, the studio is actually behind my my house. Um, but really, my studio is essentially you know my truck. I mean, all these um, I have a truck that has a, a shelf system that after I'm done painting, the paintings kind of slide in. So when I drive, right, it doesn't uh, you know they don't stick to one another. And you know, essentially, imagine those racks I showed you, but horizontal in my truck. So. Um, you know, you have to think again about that order, right? And so, well, thank you for tuning in and hopefully I got everyone's uh, questions uh, answered and thanks for, you know, joining and hopefully in the near future, you'll be able to see some work for in real life. So thanks to the Wiregrass for having me and uh, feel free to connect with me on Instagram or send me an email through my website if you have more questions.